Close your eyes and imagine. What if the things in life that cause us the greatest pain, the things that bring us grief, are challenges? Challenges designed to help us grow to ultimately become what we were always meant to be. We feel like we've been buried, but what if, like a seed, we've been planted? And having been planted, we grow to become a mighty tree. Now, open your eyes. Open your eyes to this way of viewing life. Come with me as we explore your true, infinite, eternal nature. This is Grief to Growth, and I am your host, Brian Smith. Hi there. Before we start, Brian would like to share a couple of things with you. First, did you know that Brian is a life coach, a grief guide, and a mental fitness trainer? Brian would love to help you with whatever life issues are challenging you. Brian has years of experience as well as training. You can contact Brian at www.grieftogrowth.com to learn more. Brian is the author of the best-selling book, Grief to Growth, Planted, Not Buried, which you can get on Amazon or Brian's website. This is a great book if you're in grief or to give to someone you know who is dealing with grief. Lastly, Brian creates free and paid resources for your growth. Go to www.grieftogrowth.com slash gifts, www.grief2growth.com to sign up for his newsletter, choose a gift just for signing up, and keep up with what Brian is offering. And now, here's today's episode. Please enjoy. Hey everybody, this is Brian back with another episode of Grief to Growth. And today I've got with me, I'm really excited about my guest today. His name is Mark Anthony. Uh, he's known as a psychic explorer. He's also known as a psychic lawyer. He's a fourth generation psychic medium who communicates with spirits. He's an Oxford educated attorney, licensed to practice law in Florida, Washington, D.C., and before the United States Supreme Court. He travels to mystical locations and remote corners of the world to examine ancient mysteries and supernatural phenomena. He appears nationwide on TV and radio, including CBS's TV, The Doctors, and Gaius TV, Beyond Belief with George Nuri. He's the co-host of the live stream show, The Psychic and the Doc, on the Transformation Network. Mark is a featured speaker at conferences, expos, and universities, which include Brown, Columbia, Harvard, and Yale. He's a columnist for Best Holistic Life magazine. His latest bestseller is The Afterlife Frequency and is the gold winner of the COVR Visionary Awards was up for a Pulitzer ranked by prettyprogressive.com as one of the top books about faith in God and other things. His other best-selling books are Never Letting Go and Evidence of Eternity. I've been fortunate enough to see Mark speak a couple of times. He's a fantastic speaker. He has a huge range of knowledge on a variety of subjects, and I got to spend time with Mark in Arizona uh, this past August at the Helping Parents Heal Conference, so I'm really excited to have Mark here today. Thank you, Brian. It's it's really great to be here, and it's good to see you again. We had a great time in, in Arizona, and Helping Parents Heal is such an amazing organization, and your talk there was so inspiring, and the work that you do is so incredibly important. So thank you for, for doing this and having this podcast. Well, I again, I, I've said I'm really excited about being here. I, I, I would be a little bit nervous, but I, I got to know you in Arizona because you're just, I mean, you're a big get for a podcast like mine. Um, you are, I listened to your podcast with Buddha at the Gas Pump a couple of days ago, and you know so much. Every time I see you, I'm so impressed. I've seen you give lectures on uh, the history of, of the Christian faith, which I thought was excellent. I just saw you recently give an ex, your uh, lecture on the afterlife frequency, which I want to talk to you a lot about today. But just assuming some people don't know who you are, uh, tell me about your background, how you get to do what it is you do. You know, when when you're called the psychic lawyer, that certainly raises eyebrows. And what, what it is, uh, Brian, uh, I was born into a family where the ability to communicate with spirits is, is a genetic trait. Both my mother and my father were able to perceive spirits. And I've tracked it back on both sides of my generation, uh, both both sides of my family for at least four generations into the 1890s. But the thing is, my dad was a U.S. Navy SEAL and a NASA engineer. My mother was a commercial illustrator, fashion designer. We were, for all intensive purposes, we were the all-American family next door. 
sort of. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people say, well, what was your childhood like? I said, well, it definitely wasn't Brady Bunch. It was more kind of Adam's family. <laughs> um, but but uh, all joking aside, um, it was a privilege and an honor to, to have parents that understood uh, my abilities. When I was about three and a half years old, I started seeing spirits and interacting with them. Now, you know, you're a dad, so you know it's not unusual for toddlers to have you know, make-believe and invisible friends. But when mommy and daddy can see them too, that, that adds a whole different dynamic to it. I remember, you know, when I, I I was talking to a spirit and mom goes, oh, he's got it. And dad dad's reaction was, oh, God, he's got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so they had different, different uh, takes on it. My father uh, was always very protective. And when I was about five years old, I was five years old and I was starting first grade. He said to me, he said, Mark, you can talk about this to your mother and to me, but no one else, because people who see things, other people don't get taken away. Let me tell you, Brian, that really, really scared me. And I understood why, as I got older, my father had four siblings, three sisters and a brother, and his young younger brother um, struggled his whole life with cerebral palsy. And of his three sisters, his sister Marjorie was a medium like him, as was their mother, Isabel, and their maternal grandmother, Grace. And Margie married this guy who was a religious fanatic, for lack of a better term. He was an extremely zealous Christian, and he believed that her abilities were evil. And which is really quite a shame, because one day he was getting ready to go to work, and he was a machinist at this steel plant in Pennsylvania. And that day, Marjorie said, Please don't go to work. She goes, I have a terrible feeling. She was holding the pit of her stomach, the area of her solar plexus. She begged and pleaded him. And he said, fine, fine, I'll stay home. Well, that day, Brian, a crane was lifting thousands of pounds of steel beams. And the cable snapped and the beams crushed the machine shop that he worked in and killed everybody in it. Now, presumably, had he been at work, it's like a 99% chance he would have been would have been in the machine shop and killed. Now, as I discovered when I was a teenager, her husband conspired with a psychiatrist and had her diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. She was forcibly removed from her home, taken to a mental institution, and subjected to electroshock therapy for over six months until her brain was damaged to the point she was never able to perceive spirits again. Mm -hmm. And and this happened like 20 years before I was born. It was always kind of hush hush. But when I was a teen, I started talking about it. And then my mom spilled the beans. She goes, well, let me tell you, because my mother was furious about what happened to Marjorie. And so now when I look back, dad wasn't trying to scare me. He was afraid that if I started speaking openly about perceiving spirits, that something horrible like happened to his sister could happen to me. And psychics and mediums, uh, we have been subjected to terrible prejudice and oppression. Um, in the Middle East, in certain countries, people like us are, are beheaded. Saudi Arabia a few years ago beheaded 130 people that year, a third of them for sorcery, which would be, you know, psychic and mediumistic ability. And I appreciate you let me go on a tangent about this, but this is, is part of my family background. And I was, when I was a teen, I was so drawn to the spiritual that I wanted to join the clergy. And I was raised in the Catholic faith. And, and, but then I started thinking, mm, I don't really want to do that. And, and it was too restrictive and too many rules and regulations. So I ended up going to law school. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's how I became the psychic lawyer. And and when I went public with my abilities, uh, a media outlet said, this guy's a, a lawyer and a psychic. So the media labeled me 
the psychic lawyer. And then a couple of years after that, another media outlet, when I was um, on a number of programs discussing paranormal phenomenon and ancient mysteries, they labeled me the psychic explorer. So that is how I, <laughs> I came to be where I am today. Yeah. So you, um, you had this medium best ability, you said from the time you were a toddler, it, it ran in your family, um, you decided to become a lawyer. What prompted you to to come out to as and tell people you had these abilities? Well, as I got older, you know, they began to intensify. And, you know, I had such a good relationship with my parents. I mean, we got along great. I loved my dad, you know, no matter how busy he was. He was a very busy guy. He was working on the space program and everything, but he always made time for me. And 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 that's really what kids want. They want to spend time with you. Toys and, and all that are nice, but nothing beats quality time. And mom and I would, would have these in-depth discussions about psychic ability. And, and so one day I was in my law office. All right. I was the head of a law firm. And I was thinking about spaghetti. Now, my family, my mom's family, we're of Italian descent. So thinking about spaghetti is not unusual. <laughs> um, but as I'm thinking about spaghetti, the phone rings. Uh, and my secretary puts it through and it's my mom. And she said, honey, I made spaghetti for lunch. Why don't you come over? And I thought, oh, fantastic. And, and my parents' house was only about five miles from my office. So I went there and, and you know, Brian, it was wonderful uh, laughing and talking with my parents. And but I noticed my mom looked kind of tired. And as I was leaving, she she hugged me and kissed me. And she said, I love you so much, Mark. I'm so happy that you're my son. And I hugged her and I said, I love you too, mom. And the next morning I was in court and the judge's assistant came to get me in the courtroom. And she said, Mark, we need you in chambers right now. And I knew it was bad. And it was a call from my, my secretary who was in tears. And she said, your dad called your, your mother died. Hmm. And, um, She'd had a lot of physical problems throughout her entire life. And I believe, Brian, that she knew that she was at the end of the line and she wanted to have that last lunch with me to say to say farewell. And forgive me if indulging me if I go further, uh, I spiraled into horrible depression. And you're a parent who has lost a child. So I know you understand and I know that so many of, of the listeners of this this podcast understand that that caving in feeling that that depression and yeah you know I'm a medium and I can see spirits but I was driving back from court a couple of weeks after mom passed and I'm thinking what's the sense what's the use of having this ability if if, if it's not making me feel better mm -hmm. and one of those waves of grief hit me and so I knew I better not be driving. So I pull over into this convenience store parking lot and I was sitting there and all of a sudden this flash of light goes off. And was it in my head? Was it in the car? But I immediately turned to the passenger side, the seat. And for an instant, I saw a silver white silhouette of my mother. All right, so I'm trying to process this, and then her voice fills my head. And she said, Mark, you've been given the gift of mediumship so that you would not be crushed by grief. But now you must help those who are suffering with theirs. All right, so Brian, I'm breaking out in a sweat. And then before I can even catch my breath, the next round of message messages came through, and she said, your life's mission is to help people understand that God exists, that heaven, the afterlife exists, that your souls are immortal living spirits, that humans can communicate with souls, and that we will all be reunited in the light that is God when it is your time to leave that this world. I sink back in my chair, Brian. I'm soaking wet, and all I can think of, all I said was, okay. <laughs> Everything in my life changed after that, um, but that is is what made me, and it wasn't so much a decision. The door didn't open. I, 
you know, my family's Italian. All right. So Italian spirits aren't going to be subtle. Uh, my, my spiritually <laughs> transformative experience wasn't sitting on a mountaintop in Maui going, oh, the granola. Time. No, this was a fire hose right to the face. Yeah. <laughs> this is real North Jersey. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, everything changed. And within a year, my my first book, Never Letting Go, came out. And I'd also been offered a job at a government agency. So I segued out of private practice and my manager, Rocky, and I know, you know, Rocky, she travels with me. She set up um, a speaking engagement of New York City, and then she got me a speaking engagement at Harvard. So it's a couple of weeks for Christmas and we're walking around Harvard with these steaming cups of coffee and it was beautiful and decorated for Christmas and all New Englandy and Harvardy and and I get a, a phone call on the, uh, uh, and and I, op- I, I I I get on my cell phone and it's the elected official, my boss mm-hmm. of the, the government agency, and he goes, "I'm catching too much flack from a certain party that I have a psychic on staff, and you're taking too much time off." I said, "Well, I'm you know my book came out and I'm taking um, my vacation time." I said, "But you know," and, and it hit me just like this, Brian. I said, "Let me make this really easy for you." please accept this as my resignation. I quit. And he says, oh, okay. And I hung up the phone. All of a sudden, I I said, Rocky, I just quit the legal profession. And she said, Mark, take a look around. Where are you? I'm looking around. I go, Harvard. She goes, what are you doing in an hour? I said, giving a lecture on the science of the afterlife and signing copies of my new book, Never Letting Go. And she said, don't you think this is exactly where you need to be. Mm-hmm. And I never look back. Wow. Wow. I, I, that's amazing. I, I, I love um, the way that you, you know, you leaned, leaned into it. And it, and it, you know, the, it, I think our lives kind of set us up for where we're supposed to be because your, your mind, your, you know, your perception of, of law and of science. And I've, again, I've seen you lecture on, on history and religious history you really appeal to people who are more, um, I always get left brain to right brain, right brain confused, more right brain, I guess. Uh, you, those people that are, 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 I'm sorry, you appeal to people that are left brain, people like myself. Um, because I, as I listen to you, I'm, I'm one of those people like, I need to know how things work. I just yeah. can't take things on faith. It's like, how does this work? And you go into that in great detail. Uh, I know in your books and in your lectures. So, um, I guess that, what do you think you got that, that drive to, to know, to want to know why things work the way they do? I recall when I was eight years old, I was with my dad and we were looking at the stars and he was telling me that, you know, how far they are away and how the light had burned out from them. And, and he said to me, he goes, Mark, there's no such thing as a mystery. There are only questions for which we do not yet have the answer. And if enough research, enough dedication, and enough funding, that's what he always said, if you put enough money into something and it's spent right, he said, you're going to come up with an answer. It may take years, but you're going to get an answer. And ultimately, it's going to be based on science. And you know, Brian, that really stuck with me. And my whole life, I've been interested in all types of things, archaeology, Egyptology, paleontology, um, physics, theology, philosophy. Um, I, I love science. I mean, I, I'm interested in so many different things. I mean, you know, my office, and there's all kinds of stuff. I have mean, got a whole bunch of you know dinosaurs back there, you know. <laughs> it's just, I, I've been so fascinated. And one of the things that I like about law is because I'm I'm doing I'm working full time as a medium author and a speaker and um, spiritual teacher now, but what I liked about law is that I got to work with forensics, physicists, uh, neuroscientists because I specialized in head injury uh, litigation. Also, I was criminal defense, so I had to deal with ballistics. Um, it put me in, in so many different fields, and with each case, I had to learn the science. Um, before I could cross-examine or or do direct examination of my witnesses. So my whole life, uh, you know, everything is why, and now let's see if we can find out. So so I think that, and the, the problem with the way 
way a lot of religions are. And, and I don't crash on anybody's belief system. Everybody has an absolute right. This is still the United States. We still have freedom of religion and freedom from religion, separation of church and state. Very, very, very important. If you don't believe me, tune into the news about what's going on in Afghanistan and Iran and Saudi Arabia, for that matter. And that's where you have a theocratic rule by religion. Uh uh, no, I don't want to live under Old Testament laws where if you do something, if you work on the Sabbath, you shall be put to death. I mean, you know, but Mm -hmm. the thing is, the problem with religion is believe what we're telling you. And that's fine. But is there a scientific basis for the afterlife? And the a big part of my work is bridging the divide between spirituality and science. Faith and science for centuries have been polar opposites, diametrically opposed. You know, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, I love Sir Isaac Newton, um, basically invented physics for, I mean, other, other people contributed, but he came up with the laws of optics and gravity and laws of motion. And the thing about Newton, he didn't believe in an afterlife, but he believed in God And he spent more time studying the Bible, looking for cryptic and hidden messages in Scripture than he did working on science. I mean, that's 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 amazing. But out of Newton came what's known as Newtonian reductive materialism, which means that everything, including the the microscopic, can be is just a miniature version of our world. And that if you can't see it and directly observe it, it doesn't exist. And so Newton's um, deep faith in God gets glossed over by Newtonian reductionist materialists, basically science, that thinks that all religion is mythology and baseless and there's no afterlife. And then people of faith look at the Newtonians as a bunch of heretics and blasphemers. And then comes the 20th century and quantum physics. And now we have a whole new understanding that things go far beyond Newton's molecular level down to a subatomic level where everything at the most basic unit is energy and therefore interconnected. And uh, quantum physicists in the 21st century are now saying that eternal life survival of consciousness of your soul does not violate the laws of physics. So it's taken 400 years from Newton for us to get to this point. And that's what I'm so excited about is building upon all of this and then explaining it to people that, you know, faith and science are not polar opposites they tend to explain the same thing yet through different vernacular and different filters. Yeah, well said. I I absolutely. And as I've studied this, you know, myself, I think a lot of people in our, in our Western society, especially believe that uh, the schism between science and faith has always been there, but it hasn't. It's a relatively new phenomenon. Um, And, and where, you know, they, as you said, science or, people of faith view scientists as heretics and people of science view people of faith is just like, you know, woo woo. And there's nothing to that. Um, And it's really exciting to see them kind of coming back together as science is finally discovering what faith has taught us all along. Uh, So that kind of brings us to the afterlife frequency, which is an interesting title for your book. So why did you call it the afterlife frequency? You know, this was one of those, those flukes. Um, My publisher, new world library, love them they're they're just so wonderful to work with and i had so many different working titles for the book and i i didn't didn't like any of them and they weren't thrilled about any of them and as i explain in the book spirit communication is based on adjusting your brainwave frequency to a level where spirits are able to adjust theirs and you get a frequency match and i i decided to i live near the ocean so i decided to take a walk along the beach And I was thinking, well, the book's about the afterlife, the book's about frequency. And all of a sudden, I'm looking out over the ocean, I go, the afterlife frequency. Huh. Mm -hmm. So I run home and I do a search on Google and everywhere else. And 
it's never been used. And I call my publisher and the publisher, I, I said to her, the afterlife frequency, there was a pause and she goes, I love it. <laughs> and, and so that's what happened. And, and the subtitle of the book is the scientific proof of spiritual contact and how that awareness will change your life. And um, uh, here's the, um, uh, the cover of the book. And, in, mm -hmm. and if you want to order it or find out about uh, the work that I do or sign up for my newsletter or apply for a reading, my website is afterlifefrequency.com. And um, one of the, the key concepts in the book is, is uh, I introduce several new terms because mm -hmm. the problem with mediumship and spirit communication is it's anchored in the Victorian era during the heyday of spiritualism and the terminology and, and the explanations are based on a Victorian era level of science. Well, the afterlife frequency catapults spirit communication into the 21st century. And I'm introducing new terms based on science to explain these ancient phenomena. And one of the key concepts is the electromagnetic soul, the EMS. And it de describes what we really are, a soul, a spirit, which is pure consciousness. We know from faith that all great spiritual teachers, whether it is ancient Hinduism, you know, whether it's Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Native Americanism, African animism, um, uh, Central, uh, Central and South American belief systems, all the great spiritual teachers, Brian, explain that the who and what we are, the consciousness, the soul, the spirit, pre-exists the body, comes into the body, moves on after the body dies. We know from the laws of thermodynamics and physics that energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. We know from neuroscience, which is the study of the human brain, that the brain has an electromagnetic field. So borrowing on all of that, I developed the term the electromagnetic soul to describe what we really are, which is pure consciousness. That is eternal electromagnetic energy. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's really interesting. I have to say, when I first heard the term, um, and it was at, I think it was at the lecture that you gave for Helping Parents Heal, I was like, oh, this is really cool. And I thought, but is this another form of materialism, you know, where we're trying to identify the soul physically? And then I thought, you know, why did I even have that thought? Because I, I do agree with what your father said and with your philosophy. I don't believe there's any such thing as the supernatural. There's only right. what we don't understand yet. You know, if if, if someone talked about x-rays 200 years ago, we would have said that's yeah. impossible. If we talked about a wireless internet, Bluetooth technology, when I first heard about that in the 80s, I'm like, that doesn't even make any sense. How can you have a low power wireless network? Um, but now we, we do it every day. So yes. there, there may come a point where science can identify what the soul is. Uh, and so I, li I love the way you're bringing this together. Yeah, we're, we're getting that way. And uh, Dr. Gary Schwartz, who's the um, head of the Soul Phone Project, is actually working on technology to communicate with spirits. He wrote the foreword for the afterlife frequency. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was funny. He called me up and he goes, Mark, electromagnetic soul. I love it. I want to use it. I'm going to call it the EMS for short. And I said, fantastic. And one of the great honors of my life is um, at Helping Parents Heal, uh, Gary Schwartz, Dr. Schwartz came and he spoke and he he showed a a um a slide of my book and he talked about the electromagnetic soul and he said and let us think he said some people say well this is too technical but does not the term soul stand for the source of universal love and uh, let me tell you that was such a humbling experience to have uh, one of the top research afterlife research scientists in the world not only validate my work but also um explain how how the soul is about love yeah i mean it's electromagnetic energy mm -hmm. um love is energy i mean let's face it it takes a lot of energy to love somebody yeah. um it, it does but the thing is um it is also the energy that gives meaning and purpose to human life so 
so we are now in a century and provided humans don't blow ourselves into atoms and i'm not trying to be facetious right. but unfortunately right. our um human technology so much effort is put into weapons and destruction as opposed to solving the mysteries of the universe or uh, the questions of the universe but i do believe that um that we're going to come through this i I'm, i have a good feeling where we are going to come through all this we now live in an exciting era brian where science will prove not only the existence of the afterlife but the discovery dare i say of the divine power that we call god it's a really really interesting time you're absolutely right and i'm fortunate enough to i i'm i'm on the soul phone foundation i'm the vice president of the soul phone foundation and i was able to introduce gary at the conference and yes. <laughs> I, I you know getting to know people like you exist and and gary exists and bernardo castrup who is another person that i just think is fantastic i love the fact that i can talk to people now about what i and i, I don't even like the term believe the conclusions that i've come to based upon philosophy, based upon science, based upon observation, your know, near-death experiences. Mediums have been tested now. And I can talk to people who are materialists and say, here's a reason why you should believe. You know, read yeah. Mark Anthony's book, read Bernardo Cashew's book, look at the research that Gary Schwartz has done. And I know you've been researched as a medium. And a lot of people, even to this day, don't realize this huge body of evidence. And you being a lawyer, you know, you can talk to proof, you know, right? Yeah. Uh, and I know Gary hates the word proof, but I think we're pretty close to proving it. Yeah, I think we are too. I mean, well, I know we are. And, you know, and there's always going to be the skeptics and the naysayers. There's always going to be people who don't believe. Um, I, I did a reading for for um, a woman last week, and I was good friends with her husband. And I, I knew her, and he died earlier this year. And the information that came through, I didn't know any of this. And a lot of things came through from spirits about her, including a boyfriend she once had. I mean, I even got, you know, what he looked like, his name and everything. And she was like, oh, my God. Um, and her daughters and uh, siblings were, were very receptive, but her son outright rejects it. He's a skeptic. No, nobody can talk to the dead. And mm -hmm. it's so funny when people say, you can't do this. Yeah, th th that doesn't exist. To which my response is, please explain to me your vast knowledge of quantum physics, interdimensional communication, and the dynamical interface between electromagnetic energy and a living human being and that of the collective consciousness. Please explain that to me. And usually the response you get is, oh. yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, as I said, the 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 materialism that is so prevalent in our society, where people and and people claim they're being scientific when they say that's impossible, which is not a scientific approach. That's a philosophy. Yes, and there's a big difference between being a skeptic and being a cynic. See, yeah. a skeptic will say, "Well, I don't believe, but I'd like to see the proof." In other words, a skeptic may not accept something but is open-minded to the proof. We're a mm -hmm. cynic, <clears throat> mind closed. I don't believe, period. Or then I get the, you're doing the work of Satan yeah. because it says in the book of Deuteronomy and other passages in the Bible that mediums are not of God. And it's really funny because the passage in Deuteronomy is chapter 18 and there's um, a part there that says, do not consult with mediums um, because they're not of God. But and, and people say, there it is. And it's in, in uh, line 10. I said, yes, but if you keep reading that passage and go to uh, verse 22, it sets truth as the standard because it says, how will we know a word the Lord has not spro spoken through a prophet? And basically, if it doesn't come true, then it's not of God. So in other words, if it is true, then this is a gift from God. And then when we go into the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 12, the Apostle Paul writes in great detail that there are many gifts from God. They all come from the same Spirit. And two of those gifts, and it's a very long passage, but it's a beautiful, beautiful passage. 
Two of the gifts are prophecy, which is seeing future events, and discernment of spirits, which is what I do, is discernment of spirits. And it says that all of these are from the same spirit, God. And then there's Romans 12, verses 6 through 8, which says that we all have gifts from God. And if your gift is one of prophecy, then prophesize in accordance with your faith. So there are people who like to take a salad bar approach to, to religion. Well, let's take this verse and say that God doesn't like that. Well, so, well why don't you keep reading the entire passage? Mm -hmm. you, you can't just take a phrase here or there. You have to look at the document as a whole. Now, this is where my lawyer side comes in. And when you begin to examine the entire document, the Bible is filled, Brian, with stories of people who communicate with spirits, who see future events. And when they're depicted as good guys and good girls in, in the Bible, they're prophets or prophetesses. Where they're depicted in a negative light, they're referred to as witches or mediums. And you also have to realize that this terminology is, is based on Jamesian English, the King James Version of the Bible, but you have to go back to the original Greek, which the Gospels were written in in the New Testament. The Old Testament was written in uh, Aramaic and then translated to Hebrew, then to Latin, then so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and you start seeing that some of these words are more of a byproduct of the era of King James, which led to the Salem witch trials in the New World, and there was witches under you know every every nook and cranny. So mm -hmm. that's why I always caution people about using the Bible as a means to dislike um, people. Um, I heard this one quote by um, I believe it was an Episcopalian minister. And he said that the ultimate act of ego, edging God out, ego, is creating God in your own image so that he gets to hate the same people you do. And, and I remember I posted that one time. This one lady went berserk on me, and I was trying to explain to her, this has nothing to do with God. This has to do with ego-driven people who are looking for an, uh, a, a moral justification for their hate-driven agenda. And... Um, I'm maybe, you know, crossing a line here, but when you look at um, organizations like ISIS and Al-Qaeda who claim that the Quran is justifying their acts of genocide, slavery, rape, and murder, Quran doesn't do that. These people are looking for moral justification. And the and and the, the teachings of Jesus does not did not say hate people who are different than you are, and and so that's where the difference is. Faith in God is about peace, love, understanding, healing, and resolution. It isn't about anger, bigotry, hatred, and violence. Those are all byproducts of the human ego, the thing created by the mind. And people like like you know, Osama bin Laden, if you tell a bunch of morons, go fly these planes into a building because I don't like U.S. foreign policy, they're probably not going to do it. But if you tell them God will guarantee you 72 virgins, which, you know, is, is ridiculous in and of itself, um, and, and you never know. Uh, now, I won't even say that. This is a, a positive show. You got to be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but the thing is, um, religion has been used as an extension of people, whether it was the Roman Empire, the Islamic Empire, the, the British Empire, the United States. It's been used as an extension of, of people's ego-driven agendas. And when you get away from that and see what the true meaning, the true connection is, it's all about love. It's all about the soul, the source of universal love. Yes. I think, again, you were so well said because you talked about, you know, for example, the Bible. And people will take the Bible and they'll take parts that they like and they'll leave the other parts out. And we all do that. We all cherry pick things because you you have to. It's a, it's a big book. But um, yeah. we can see the the splinter in the other person's eye, but not the log in our own eye, right? So we look at Islam, for example, a lot of it say, Oh, it's a violent religion. 
you know, because look at what they're doing and look, the Quran justifies this. So people will go find verses in the Quran that are violent, but then you can find those same types of verses actually even more in the Hebrew yeah. scriptures. Um, yeah. And But we, we now in modern society say, no, we don't stone children for talking back to their parents. And we don't, you know, we don't, you know, do these things that are in there because we've, we've advanced. Um, and I, I have a lot of times people come to me and say, oh, Brian, just read your Bible. If you just read your Bible, you'd understand. And I'm like, I've read the entire thing. Not only that, I know the history. And I love what you do in some of your lectures is breaking that in history. And, and people don't understand, like, where did your Bible come from? How, who decided what books were in there? What books were left out? Um, yes. King, King James did a terrible job of translating. It's just awful. Oh. Um, the word hell, because the word hell should never, ever appear in the Hebrew scriptures. But no. in, in you know, hell. Oh, gosh, I give a whole lecture on the, the historical, the development of hell. But yeah, go ahead, Brian. I, I, finish your thought. No, I, I, I want to say I, I appreciate people like you doing that, because that, that lecture you gave, the first one I saw you give was on this history. And people in the room who are Christians who think they understand their faith have no idea. You know, most of them really don't know. So um, I, I met people that think that Jesus's last name was Christ. Yes. Yes. I, I mean, it, it, Christ is is a, um, from a Greek word Christos, which means the anointed one, and a king is anointed. And Jesus, according to the Book of Matthew, is a descendant of King David, and therefore was the anointed one. And it was, and his name in in Aramaic or, or the closest we could pronounce would be Yeshua. He was um, Yeshua Christos, Yeshua, Jesus, the anointed one. But there's people like, yeah, Mr. and Mrs. Christ, Mary and Joseph were at Bethlehem. And it's like, I'm sorry, I don't mean to affect a Southern accent. And and uh, I've done that. And I've had uh, friends of mine that are that are uh, from the South who are anything but uh, ignorant <laughs> or, or stupid uh, get annoyed with me. But, you know, it's okay. I'll imitate my relatives from New Jersey if you want. Yeah. But the point is, uh, the point is... Um, well, look at Jamesy in English. If I, Brian, if I say the word awful, if I said the awful majesty of God, what would that mean to you? It means terrible. Exactly. In the 20th and 21st centuries, awful means terrible. But in the time of King James, the awful majesty of God meant full of awe. Mm -hmm. We are full of awe of the majesty of God. Now, that's one word. That's one word. And um, I was on a radio show one time, and somebody called in, and, and he was obviously an evangelical and, and not one that, that studies the Bible, because I have a lot of evangelical friends, and we have protracted discussions about this. And he said that mediums are not of God. And I said, and what version of the Bible do you use? Because he goes, what do you mean? I go, well, there's 20, at least 23, more like 26 versions of the Bible. Well, the one true Bible, the King James Version. It's like, now I knew I had them. <laughs> okay. It's like, <clears throat> I said, and what does your Bible say about gays, uh, the gay and lesbian community? And then he he launched into um, um, uh, gays are are evil and immoral and not of God and should burn in hell and all this. And I said, well, what do you know about King James? He said, what do you mean? What do you know about King James? Well, he 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 wrote this Bible. I said, no, he didn't write this Bible. <laughs> I said, King James was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, who was a Catholic queen of Scotland. But she was executed by her good Christian cousin, Elizabeth I of England. And when Elizabeth died childless, James, her son, became the, uh, he was James VI of Scotland, and he became James I of the United Kingdom of England and Scotland. So mm -hmm. there he is in London. And his uh, and and also James lived openly with another man. Um, he was clearly gay, and in fact, his nickname behind his back, of course, was the Nancy King. 
So here we have, and, and, and he was really involved with the Globe Theater and the Shakespearean stuff. And that's why the Puritans burned the Globe Theater to the ground. So we start doing the backstory here. So you have this very effeminate, flamboyant king. Hmm. And his advisor said, well, now you're um, the, the head of the, the Church of England. And we want to put out a Bible in English like the Germans did with Martin Luther instead of it being in Latin, being in English, so the people could can read it. And he said, fine. So that's how it came into existence. And I said, so the Bible that you used to oppress gays was ordered into existence by a gay man. He said, well, that's that's heresy. I said, no, my friend, that is history. And, and uh, I heard a click, and the host of the show said, Mark, you are welcome back anytime. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, again, fighting fighting this this ignorance that that we all have. We are ignorant at some point, and ignorant is not a bad word. About, yeah, something. Yes. Yeah. yeah, ignorant is not a bad word. But for for me, I was driven to study this by my fear of death, my fear of what you know, what was in the afterlife, the fear of hell, uh, and it didn't make any sense to me. I, and so I started studying history, and I, and I heard you talk about this uh, the other day. The the original church fathers had very different beliefs than people have now about like eternal damnation, for example, um, or, or reincarnation. You know, we, we believe that Christians have never believed in reincarnation. And when you really study it, you find out the Christianity did at one time and you find out when it got drummed out of Christianity. Oh, uh, absolutely. Um, one of my favorite, one of the most mystical passages in the Bible, um, and it's in three different gospels, um, I know it's in Luke, I think it's in Mark, and I think the other one could be Matthew. And it's called the Transfiguration. Mm -hmm. And Jesus takes a select group of his disciples to the to a top of a mountain, and all of a sudden he glows white, and there's mist, bright light around him, and the spirits of Moses and Elijah appear on either side of him. Now, if this isn't mediumship, I don't know what is. In fact, this goes even further. This could be an example of what's known as physical mediumship. I've yet to see a legitimate physical medium. These people sit in the dark and talk in goofy voices. That's a bunch of nonsense. Um, if, it, if it can't be done in the light, forget it. Okay. Um, nothing about God, nothing about the light, nothing about love is to be hidden in darkness. And... What's fascinating from a uh, metaphorical standpoint is Elijah was the, excuse me, Moses was the giver, the bringer of the law. Mm -hmm. Elijah was the enforcement of the law, and Jesus was the embodiment of the law. That's how um, this passage has been interpreted by um, by Christian uh, scholars in the metaphorical sense. So they come mm -hmm. off the mountain and Jesus says, don't tell anybody about this. All right. Mm -hmm. And then there's a discussion of, well, who do you say that I am? And the disciples say, well, some say that you are the prophet Elijah. Others say that you are John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was Jesus's first cousin. And we know that he was uh, beheaded by Herod Antipas. Um, and, and I could go on and on and on. But but um, there was a story of, you know, Herod was hot for this woman, Salome. And he said if she would dance for him, which is apparently a very seductive dance, he would give her whatever she wanted. And John the Baptist was a Hebrew prophet speaking out against the immorality of Herod and his court. And, and he's the one that baptized Jesus in the River Jordan. And so she she dances. And he goes, I'll give you whatever. And she goes, I want the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter. And so that's where that term, you know, his head on a silver platter comes from. Long mm -hmm. story short, Jesus said, Elijah has already returned, but they did not recognize him, for he appeared in the form of John the Baptist. Whoa. Elijah lived 800 years before Jesus and his cousin, John the Baptist. And not just progressive Christian scholars, but Hindu scholars, Buddhist scholars, um, metaphysicians have zeroed in on this passage as possibly being Jesus discussing 
Elijah having reincarnated as John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. And what happened is the first version of the Bible was ordered into existence roughly 300 years after Jesus's death by the Roman Emperor Constantine. And it was at the Council of Nicaea. And basically, Constantine said, look, um, the ancient religion of the gods of Mount Olympus, nobody believes in that anyway. Pretty much the empire is Christian, so we need an authoritative text. So the Torah, the, the Old Testament, uh, the Jewish scriptures were, were um, designated as the Old Testament. And then the letters of Paul and all of the, the Gospels were compiled at the first ecumenical council, which essentially was the Council of Nicaea, and the first version of the Bible came out. Well, in the aftermath of that, uh, a great Christian theologian, Origen, and he lived in the city of Alexandria uh, in Egypt, Origen wrote that everyone goes through a succession of lifetimes until they ascend to the level with God. He said, even Lucifer will eventually ascend to the level and basically will return to heaven. And so in the early centuries of Christianity, reincarnation was one of the basic tenets. But then by the 6th century, the reign of uh, what we now call the Byzantine, the eastern half of the Roman Empire, the western half collapsed, but the eastern half continued. And at the 5th Ecumenical Council of Constantinople, I think it was around the year 525, 527, um, there was a new version of the Bible. It was rewritten. All the references of of reincarnation were removed. I think they missed the transfiguration. They missed the and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And reincarnation was declared heresy. So you have to realize between Constantine and the Emperor Justinian at the Fifth Ecumenical Council, there's another 250 years and if this was the fifth ecumenical council there were four others where each time the bible was revised and you know and people say well what you're talking about is heresy it's like no this is history and and this is not not degrading anyone of the christian faith um you know i've studied christianity i, I even uh, you know consider going to the clergy i i have no problem with any of this, but we also have to take into account that the document we refer to as the Bible has undergone a tremendous amount of editing and rewriting, and unfortunately, it has all too often become subjected to the political agenda of a Roman emperor, a Byzantine emperor, or various Christian kings throughout Europe yeah. and popes. I <laughs> and I think and that's and and, and again, I don't I don't belittle anyone's faith. My grandfather was a was a pastor. I grew up in his church. I grew up with with the Bible, um, and I still revere the Bible. I still revere Jesus. I I think there's a lot of good stuff in there. But Thomas Jefferson said it really well. You have to separate the diamonds from the dung. And there's a lot of there's a lot of crap in there that was put in deliberately. And understanding this history for some people might say, well, that's that's boring. I don't care about that. But when you say things like I'm a Christian, so I can't believe in reincarnation. Understand that Origen did, for example. Um, mm -hmm. When I got all, I was all spun out about eternal hell, and I started reading about it. I found out about this thing called Christian universalism, which was the prevalent belief of the Christian church for like the first 500 years, that everyone yeah. would eventually be saved. That, you know, if there was a hell, it's a temporary place of correction. Um, and, and you know, Jesus even made some, some comments about like, that. I will, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, gates keep things out. What he was saying was, I'm going to go into hell and get those people out. That was that's what that passage meant. And we take it to mean the exact opposite. So I love right. what you're doing with educating people because I think we all need to be more aware of like what it is we think we've always believed. Um, I was taught about the rapture and that Jesus was coming back any moment. I didn't realize that only came out in like the 1800s. <laughs> The people started believing yeah, that in, in the rapture. So these these things are really important. Well, you, you, 
there are certain universal concepts, energy neither being created nor destroyed, only, only transferred. I'm currently working on an article for the March issue of Best Holistic Life magazine. And, um, and, and, and if people want to subscribe, it's a free online subscription, bestholisticlife.com, all one word, Best Holistic Life. And it's a wonderful magazine, Body, Mind, and Soul, and, and I'm a monthly contributor. And I'm writing about the legend of the shamrock and St. Patrick. And um, St. Patrick is such a fascinating character. He was a Roman citizen. These are in the waning days of the Roman Empire. And apparently he was a rich kid living on the west coast of, of what is now Britain. And But uh, the Romans had to withdraw their, their garrison from Britain because, you know, barbarian hordes were flooding the empire. So Brit Britannia was defenseless and all of a sudden pirates invade and they uh, kidnap the 16 year old, um, um, his name was Maywin Sukkot, took him to Ireland, sold him into slavery. And eventually as he acted as a shepherd. He, he was working for a landowner as a shepherd. And it's sort of like he had his King David moment. You know, he here he was the shepherd and God spoke to him in a vision and, and uh, angels came to him and he saw a great light and they said, go in this direction um, and you'll find a ship that will take you to freedom. And he did. And eventually he began preaching in Ireland hmm. um, and the Irish at that time, they had druidic beliefs, very like almost more like Wiccan beliefs, beliefs in nature. That's where like leprechauns and sprites and all these elemental type energies and his name wasn't patrick but he 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 was um referred to by the roman title like uh paternus which became patrick interesting so he because okay. that meant father and so mm -hmm. that's so his real name was maywin sukat but we know him as patrick and and he had a really wonderful way of of speaking to the druids he didn't go in and say your religion is wrong all right we hear that all the time there's only one way he combined their belief in nature with spirituality with christian spirituality and he took the three leaves of the shamrock to represent father son and holy spirit mm -hmm. now if you look at hinduism you have brahma the creator vishnu the destroyer uh, excuse me the sustainer Shiva, the destroyer, Buddhism, birth, death, rebirth. There's these universal concepts. Energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. So Patrick used a shamrock, a very common um, a leaf in, in Ireland, to explain the basis of eternal life. And instead of telling the Druids they were wrong, he basically put a new spin on their, their belief systems. And so what religions are all doing is they are attempting to under um, explain through their various cultural nuances the same concept, that life is eternal, that energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. And, and as, as uh, Rhonda Schwartz, Dr. Gary Schwartz's wife, and she's a very gifted medium, mm -hmm. she said such a wonderful thing. We have one life and it is eternal. And, and so that's what Patrick was teaching people. And so I love it when I, you know, and I know that when we celebrate St. Patrick's Day, it's a, you know, it's a big party and a lot of you know, good food and, and drinking and all that, but, but, um, and, but don't drink and drive. Um, yeah. But um, the, the symbolism of a shamrock is more than just the luck of the Irish. It has a much deeper meaning and application for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why history is, you know, is it really important to understand. I want to talk um, more about some of the concepts in your book. And I know one of the concepts you talk about is the collective consciousness so yes. what does that mean? The collective consciousness. All right. Our electromagnetic soul, our EMS, is, is what makes us unique. That's the who and what we are. That's our spirit. The brain does not create consciousness. It merely hosts it. Just the way, way your computer does not did not create Windows 10 or Windows 11 or whatever operating system, it merely hosts it. 
and the data that's on it. And so when our brain or hard drive crashes, in other words, when we die, that energy, think of it, uh, our electromagnetic soul is a drop of water and it leaves the body and plunges into this eternal sea of souls, which is the collective consciousness. You still maintain your identity and your individuality, but now you're energetically linked to other spirits, linked to other spirits, linked to other spirits. And that is, is very possibly, I believe, how we're all cells in the body of God. Now, we've all heard that, cells in the body of God. Um, Edgar Cayce, uh, the great, great uh, psychic um, who, who founded the Edgar Cayce Center over you know 70 plus years ago, referred to this as the universal mind. Uh, the Hindus call this Krishna consciousness. Christians call this Christ consciousness. So what it is, our soul becomes part of this vast intelligence. And so when we engage in spirit communication, it's not that the, the spirit um, separates permanently. I call it the collective consciousness disconnect. But what it is, um, a soul will adjust his or her vibrational frequency to align with our brainwave frequency so that we can communicate. And messages from the collective consciousness are, are beautiful. They're all about love, healing, inner peace, resolution. Uh, that's why during spirit communication, when a spirit will communicate with me, many times they will give medical information about the person I'm doing the reading for or someone close to them in this world. And the medical information that they give far exceeds anything I ever knew. Um, and that's because healing is a gift from God. So the collective consciousness is the vast intelligence network that we are all connected to. And while we're in this body, we are connected to it, but we're not always completely aware of that. So and that brings us to like mediumship, which is always, you know, fascinating to me. And again, some people say it's it's all fake and, and all that stuff. But, you know, a question I think people have is like, so if you're communicating with the spirit, why can't they just speak to you like in English? Like you and I are speaking to each other. Why don't they just say, hey, my name is John. I was 52 years old when I died and the keys are in the kitchen drawer. Um, yeah, well, they they, they can. Um, first off, they do talk to us, but spirits don't speak English. They don't speak a human language. They speak frequency. Hence, you know, once again, you know, my book, The Afterlife Frequency. So mm -hmm. what an electromagnetic soul, a spirit does, is he, she, or a group of them, the collective, mm -hmm. emits a wave of electromagnetic frequency. That EM impulse goes into my brain. The electromagnetic field, my EMS, then in, in my brain, then it, it um, is converted into recognizable concepts based on my memories, feelings, and cultural associations. Mm. And that's why uh, if I do readings for people and they had relatives that did not speak English, they can still communicate. Like I was doing a reading for uh, this woman and, and she was from Argentina, I think. And her son came through and I saw Excalibur and the sword and the so stone and King Arthur. And, and I've been doing this long enough. I know no matter how weird it is, say it. So I explained this to her. She goes, oh, my. I go, why? She goes, my son's favorite story as a boy was the sword in the stone. And his name was Arturo, mm. which is Arthur. Okay. Boom. Yeah. So that's why a lot of these things are metaphor um, or symbolic because it's transmitted to me through frequency. And I have to explain it so that the person can understand. Um, I, I, this example happened a couple months back. I was doing a reading for this woman and her mother's spirit came through and this is medical. And I said, she's talking about, there's a young boy, it feels like he's around seven, who's in this world connected to you. She goes, well, I don't have any children, but I have a nephew who's seven and I'm very close to him. Mm -hmm. I said, well, there's a problem with his eyes. And I said, there's something with the eyes because I'm feeling pain in my eyes. What it is, the spirit is sending an EM impulse and the sensation, I feel pressure in my eyes. 
they're not hurting me. It's merely a sensation. So I know that the, uh, the spirits talk about um, his eyes. And she said, that's interesting because I was talking to my sister recently and she said he was complaining about vision issues. And, and I said, your mother says you got to take him to the eye doctor. And now I'm hearing little Richard singing, tutti frutti, ah, Rudy. And I'm singing this. She goes, Mark, that makes no sense whatsoever. I said, look, I just deliver the message. A month later, Brian, I get an email. She said, all right, I called my sister. We made an appointment for my nephew. All three of us went with, you know, to, together. And as soon as we walked into the doctor's office on the radio, it started playing Tutti Frutti, Ah Rudy by Little Richard. Wow. Now, a skeptic. Oh, that's a coincidence. Really? Let's do the statistical odds on that. And I'll bet it's going to be more than trying to win the 1.7 billion or 2 billion Powerball. Yeah. Here's what was going on. On everything's made of molecules, which are made of atoms, which are made of electrons, protons, and neutrons, and the smallest particles of quantum, ergo the term quantum physics. Everything is electromagnetic energy at its most basic level. Since the time of Albert Einstein and his theory of relativity, it has been theorized there is no time on the subatomic level. Electromagnetic soul, electromagnetic again, they are in, in a higher frequency, and because time doesn't exist, they are able to perceive what you and I would refer to as past, present, and future. So the spirit was coming through and saying, my grandson needs to go to the eye doctor because he needs glasses. That was the message. And because uh, the mother spirit is an electromagnetic soul, she can foresee future events knew that they would be going to this eye doctor and to verify that they were in the right place at the right time. She knew the song radio waves are in the electromagnetic spectrum that would be playing at the precise second that they walked into the doctor's office. That's what happened. This isn't hocus pocus or magic. Mm -hmm. This is real phenomenon, which is explainable through quantum physics. And that's what I've dedicated my life to, and that's why I wrote the book, The Afterlife Frequency, to explain to people, mediumship, near-death experiences, shared death experiences, deathbed visions, when spirits talk to you in a dream, if you feel somebody around you, none of this is, is a hallucination. It is simply different phenomena, which is based on the same energetic modality of electromagnetic energy in the interface of our electromagnetic soul with the afterlife frequency. And it is all explainable. This is real. That is, Mark, that is the best explanation. And I've asked so many mediums to explain to me how this works. Uh, and that's the best explanation I've ever gotten for why it's not just that direct English communication, as you said, it's an electromagnetic thing for why it seems like medium can only get, for example, names that they've heard before usually, or experiences they've had, because it's got to be something that resonates with their brain. I think that was a, that was phenomenal. Thank you for well, explaining yeah, that. Yeah. Well, um, it's funny, especially with names. I mean, that's the icing on the cake for mediums. We all want names. And yeah. um, I was doing a reading recently for this lady from Bulgaria and I'm laughing because this was a funny one. And the spirit came through and I heard the word incidental. I go, incidental. And she goes, Oh, wait. And and I don't speak a lick of Bulgarian. She goes, Mark, I think that's my uncle. I go, why? She said his name in Bulgarian, Brian. Mm -hmm. And by God, it didn't sound like the word incidental. It was like incidental, whatever it was in Bulgarian. It's and we were both laughing. She goes, I think that that is it. And I go, I think that's it too. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had a, the first reading I ever had was with Suzanne Wilson, who was just amazing. And um, she was trying to get my daughter's name. And my daughter's like, you're never going to get it. You're never going to get it. She's telling her this. And she said, I can't get her name. She said, but I'm seeing like an old black and white cowboy movie. So neither one of us could make any sense of this. So I posted the reading on the internet. I said well, how phenomenal she was and everything. And I said, she got this old black and white cowboy movie. And someone said, it's the movie Shane. And my daughter's name is Shana. But there neither she nor I knew that's what it was because I didn't recognize the movie and she, you know, she she didn't put it together either. But it was that third party validation that that validated that, you know, she was getting the name. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and, and um, I, I, along those lines, just the other brand new example. I'm doing a reading for this lady the other night and her brother came through. And all of a sudden I'm seeing the uh, cartoon movie, The Lion King. OK, and I go, did he like The Lion King? She was, well, I don't know. And I go, well, I'm not seeing Simba. I'm seeing Nala. Remember Simba's girlfriend was Nala. Uh, the the female lion. I go Nala. She goes, well, that's interesting. I said, why? She said, well, my sister was pregnant, and um, and we said that if if it was going to be a girl, we were going to name the baby Nola in honor of my brother Nolan. And I go, whoa, 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 hold on a second. Nala, Nola, Nolan. She goes, oh dear God. So yeah. bang, bang, boom, and that's what I call a multiple meaning message. I was getting Nala because just like you were explaining with, with the movie Shane, Nala, Nola, okay, Mitchell, Michael, Cindy, Sandy, Danny, Donnie, when you're doing spirit communication, if you get something that's really close, like incidental and whatever pronunciation, right, you've right. you got to work with that. See, people think that this is texting an instant message. Well, if you're really real, they're going to give me, uh, why don't they give me six winning Powerball numbers? Well, maybe they will give you six numbers and maybe those numbers are winning numbers, but they didn't tell you when they're going to be winning numbers. <laughs> maybe these numbers are going to come out 20 years, 12 days and eight hours from now, you know, and, and also, um, and, and we all, we all hear this. Well, that's not what it's for. Spirits aren't concerned with material wealth, right? Right. They're looking at things from an infinite perspective. Yeah. I think most people would love to win the lottery. Um, but that's not what spirit communication is about. It's about right. bringing messages of love, healing, inner peace, protection, and resolution. Right. Uh, a grandmother saying my grandson's eyes need to be, uh, um, um adjusted i um um uh, he needed glasses and protected right. i was doing a public event in florida and it, this was a really hard one because it was like two weeks after my father died mm -hmm. and so i was you know yes i'm gonna meet him and all that but still i mean i was grieving my dad yeah and there was a mother and a daughter there and the mother's father came through which would be the girl's grandfather and the message was don't go to the concert comes right out of my mouth. And I see the look of disappointment on the girl's face. And the mother says, well, she's supposed to go to a concert next week with her friends. I said, the message is don't get in that car. Don't go to the concert. Don't get in that car. The event was over a year later. I'm doing another event at that venue. And this mother and daughter walk up to me. Do you remember us? And they, they explained it. And let me tell you, it was, I said, well, yeah, I kind of remember something about that. The girl goes, well, I called my friends and I said, I'm not going to the concert. They go, why? Well, the psychic said, I'm not supposed to get in the car to go to the concert. And she said, my friends were so freaked out. They're driving up the interstate and I-95 and they decided to go really slow. And all of a sudden they ran over something and all four tires blew out. And they were stuck on the side of the highway. And when the uh, uh, Florida Highway Patrol got there, he said, thank God you girls were only going 50 miles an hour. If you've been going uh, 80, you know, 70, 80 miles an hour, you, chances are your car would have flipped. Now, mm. four blowouts. And right. the thing is, at the time of the reading, that's what I was getting. It wasn't getting the tires going to be blown out. And, and I can see where skeptics would say, well, you know, you know, it's like, yeah, but this was a message of protection. And what was really nice is that this young lady had the foresight to transmit that message to her friends. So not only did it save her life, it saved theirs. Now, granted, they were inconvenienced right, sitting right. on the highway with four blowouts, but it's a lot better than, than what could have happened. So spirit communication is so incredibly complex. And I refer to a reading like a flower. And it blooms, blossoms, unfolds. Your example, you got the message of the, the black and white uh, cowboy movie, Shane. And it didn't make sense right away because it needed to unfold. Mm -hmm. And then you realize that Shane was Shana. Mm -hmm. and, and it's the same thing when you get these messages 
of of like don't get in that car and certainly i didn't want to you know ruin a teenager's trip to a concert right but her grandfather was going to make sure that that um he came through to give a message of protection and that's why a lot of times when information comes through and i've been i was on um um the cbs the doctors I did a reading in a cold case and information that came through didn't make sense. A lot of it didn't make sense to the family mm-hmm. at the time. But then when they took it to the Phoenix police, the information led to the arrest of, of uh, the murderer who is currently awaiting, awaiting trial. And it's because the unfolding takes time. Also messages transmitted by spirits are not always immediately recognizable. Right. It takes time. It could be about a future event. And especially when we're working with law enforcement. Yes, yeah, psychic intuition isn't admissible in a court of law. I'm a trial lawyer. OK, yeah. it's hearsay. And can you think of anything more hearsay than a message from a spirit, <laughs> an out of court statement offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted? But what we can do is we can get information which can point the investigators and, and point the police in the direction to where they will be able to find evidence which is admissible. So when we do assist law enforcement, it's a behind the scenes thing. And uh, it's, you know, and law enforcement has have been using psychics for centuries. Yeah, I, I know several psychics that are used by law enforcement under the covers. You know, the law, law enforcement won't admit it, but they'll call them up and ask them for help on a case. Exactly. Yeah, I do. I do <laughs> want to talk about one one more concept. I'm, I, I'm holding you over, sure. but I, I'm having such a great time in this conversation. And I, I'm, I'm still working through this because you mentioned time. I know Einstein said time was an illusion. I think other scientists said, said, said time and illusion. I, I have a really good friend at work. His name is Kelvin Chen. He he's really an afterlife expert. And he says, well, it's ridiculous to say there's no time on the other side because there is time. So I'm trying to reconcile these two things. And I believe that time is just different. Uh, and and you mentioned something earlier, like, you know, like time is relative. So if we could travel at the speed of light or faster, then we could, time would be different for us. And that might explain right. why spirits can, quote, predict the future because it's not the future for them. Right. Well, once again, we're trying to understand what it's like to be an infinite being. Um, So many people, I'll be doing readings for them, and they say, are they happy? He said, yes, 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 they're happy. (laughs) You know, um, because spirits are pure energy. Energy never gets old, sick, tired, sad, or, or dies. And this is also trying to understand Einstein's theory of relativity. Mm-hmm. Um, at, when Albert Einstein came to the United States and he got off the ship, there was a whole crew of reporters there. And one reporter yelled out, Professor Einstein, can you explain your theory of relativity in, in one sentence? And he said, I have been trying my whole life to just to get it in one book. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, it's very, very complex. And I, I know what uh, Mr. Chin's talking about. Well, time is relative. I think what you said is time is different um, in in spirit. But from what they've told me is that time is time less. You see, we've created the illusion of time because our earth rotates and there's light and then dark. Plus, we grow old. I mean, we're, we're born and if we're fortunate, we grow old and then, then we die. So we create a way of measuring all of this. But we're also trying as finite beings with a limited materialist, uh, material world, finite means of perception, trying to understand the infinite. So what spirits have told me is time is timeless and it doesn't exist in the afterlife frequency, at least not in the way that we're able to understand it. So Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, that's what has been presented to me. That's what I think it is. I think it, you know, Kelvin, and I don't want to get too deep into this, but he's like, well, if there was no time that there'd be no change, because time is a measurement of change and things happen. So there must be time. And that's why I've come to the conclusion. It's different. You know, it's like, for example, we can we can 
travel through the three dimensions of space, but we can't travel through time. But what if it's like you could travel through time? What if you were in a, in a position where you could well, do that? Okay. All right. Let's say this is Earth and this is Alpha Centauri. Mm -hmm. And Alpha Centauri is roughly four light years from Earth. And it takes um, light travels 5.33 trillion miles in a year. So let's do the math. Four times 5.33 <laughs> trillion. All right, we're talking a real long time. So even if we could um, create a spaceship that could move at the speed of light, it would still take four plus years to get to Alpha Centauri. Right. Well, according to the Alcubera effect, Alcubera is a Mexican physicist who said that if a spaceship could generate a warp field, and I know we're sounding all Star Trekian, but you know, Trek got this from, from physicists, mm -hmm. an energy field strong enough, because Albert Einstein said that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. But Einstein and, and uh, physicists since then have said that if you can create a um, energy field significant enough, you can warp space time so you jump from one coordinate to the next instantaneously. Therefore, you're folding space time as mm -hmm. opposed to breaking um, the, the speed of light. And this is really fascinating stuff. Um, this is also, and I know we're, we're getting off topic, but um, I've worked with a lot of UFO experts and another thing I'm interested in. Yeah. And um, that's... Uh, Colonel John Alexander, who used to be the head of the U U.S. military's UFO project, and he was the former president of IANS, International Association for Near-Death Studies. He said, a UFO isn't a tin can flying through space for thousands of years. They figured out a way to fold space time. And now physicists on planet Earth said, we can do this. It's just how do we create uh, an engine capable of generating that amount of energy. And there's a lot more to this. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, once again, time here is a relative theory of relativity concept. Right. Right. You know, for you and I jumping on a, a NASA vehicle and cranking up the engine, it's going to take us, you know, years, decades, uh, centuries to get to Alpha Centauri. But or if we're able to generate that time of ripple that type of ripple in space time, we could be there um, in simultaneously. So what I think is, and what I believe is that spirits are using a similar modality to jump from the afterlife frequency dimension, the other side dimension to ours. And so that the afterlife isn't some distant, distant uh, realm orbiting, you know, uh, the Andromeda galaxy. It is a parallel dimension, yet uses an energetic modality to jump dimensions. And I think that the Alcubera effect is, is heading in the right direction for us to understand this. Yeah, I, I appreciate you going down that rabbit hole with me. I think, um, and the point I want to make to people is when we say things are impossible, like spirit couldn't possibly know the future or time travel is impossible. I know it freaks our minds out. Our brains can't understand it, but there is some physics behind it that sure. would make sense if you really understand the physics. So I, I just, I caution people when you ever say anything is impossible because it's only what we don't know yet. Um, well, Mark, I, I've gone way over time with you, but I really appreciate you being here with me today. Um, tell people where you, they can reach you, um, about that got by getting the book the afterlife frequency your other books etc sure um please visit my website afterlifefrequency.com i invite you to sign up for my newsletter i have a weekly live stream show the psychic and the doc my co-host dr pat basili uh and i we take calls from listeners i do readings in tandem with her uh really amazing insights a uh, very healing show um and you can sign up for a reading with me all through the website, afterlifefrequency.com. And Brian, I really want to thank you for having me on the show and thank you for indulging me. And it's, I always love when we get together because there is never a lack uh, of conversation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, 
podcast. So, yeah, I, I just I, I said at the beginning, and I truly mean this. You are I, you're brilliant. I, I mean, you, it's like I wanted to say, like, is there anything you don't know? So I love I love having you on. I love having these conversations with you, and I hope people follow along and and just open your minds. So thanks for being here, Mark. Thank you. Don't forget to like, hit that big red subscribe button, and click the notify bell. Thanks for being here.